All right, we're going to talk about capacitance, and this is going to be the first application of uh, our parallel plates because a capacitor is basically a set of parallel plates. So, oh, so what is a capacitor? Often, um, often a capacitor is just a set of parallel plates that you charge up. When you apply a voltage to, uh, to a capacitor, you're going to end up getting positive charges on the, an excess of positive charges on the positive term, the side on the positive, connected to the positive terminal, terminal, and an excess of negative charges on the side connected to the negative ter terminal. Now, in practice, most of the capacitors that you will see in the laboratory and in, uh, in household electronic circuits are um, not parallel plates, but you take two plates and you roll them up together, roll them up like a jelly roll, and uh, then you put a, you connect, you have some dielectric, some insulator or a dielectric in between the two of them, uh, and that is going to keep the charge from getting, uh, from flowing between the two plates. Um, but it's going to also make the capacitor much more compact than if you had to have literal parallel plates. Um, so here you can see, you can usually think, even if this is not actually what most capacitors look like, you can think about them as parallel plates um, because to a good approximation they are. Now even if you have one of these jelly rolls, if you look, the, the separation between the two plates is very, very small. So if you are looking, if you, are, if you were a charge sitting on, the, on a point of that parallel plate, of that capacitor, you would not see the curvature in the capacitor anyhow. So it's a pretty good approximation because the capacitor is so large compared to the, the curvature. So on a, if you're a little electron sitting on there, it, the curvature doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, so um, if you have parallel plates, um, the the charges in the uh, the charges that you build up on either side of the capacitor can be related as follows. The capacitance is then equal to the charge over the voltage, um, and well, and this is going to be true also for non-parallel plates, but specifically for a parallel plate capacitor, then uh, this capacitance is equal to the area of either side divided by the distance between the two plates. Um, and the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field is then the surface density of the charge divided by uh, the permittivity of free space. It is also equal to the voltage divided by the um, separation between the two uh, layers of the capacitor. So this term, so this is the definition of the capacitance, the charge divided by the voltage, and this is specifically true only for a parallel plate capacitor. Um, then the electric field, if you have parallel plates, is the voltage divided by the distance or the um, charge density per unit area. Um, you can then re and then you can rewrite the electric field as the charge divided by the permittivity of free space times the area. So there's different ways you can manipulate this. You do want to be careful that you are only using the, um, when you're not working with parallel plate capacitors, be careful that you are, um, you can use this, but you cannot use the rest of these equations. All right. This is a picture of some typical capacitors used in electronics devices. At some point, you're going to have a laboratory um, where you uh, where you use capacitors, and this is more like um, what these capacitors are going to look like. The capacitance is not proportional to the size of the capacitor, although uh, if you have very large capacitors, then yeah, to have very large capacitance, you usually do have to have very large capacitors. Um, but in general, it's not directly related to the size. Um, you can, there's also an application of this. So we're talking here about most of the discussion in this physics chap, in this chapter is on, on physics applications, like when you're th thinking about basic cir circuits, but there are a lot of circuits, not just in, uh, in, in a physics laboratory and not just in electronics. Much of the way that your body works is by looking at, by using the differences between in potential between a cell, the inside of a cell and the outside of a cell. So uh, you might not have known this, but in general, the insides of cells are, have net negative charge while the outsides of cells have a net positive charge. And the membrane of that cell is extremely thin compared to 
the size of the cell. Um, so you can get close to approximating a cell membrane as a capacitor. You have a negative charge here and a positive charge here. This energy that is stored in the capacitor uh, in your cell walls is actually used for a lot by a lot of different proteins that sit in your cell membrane. So you can have, for instance, ion pumps that uh, that pump the that will pump um, potassium out um, or and sodium in. You can get so these ion pumps can actually you will actually use the um, will use the potential difference between the two sides of the cell wall, and they're so they're actually using the Coulomb force and. Uh, and they work on this potential difference. And that's also how, for instance, axions in, a, in, in your neurons work. Now, a fun thing, giant squid axions, giant, squids have an, giant squid have an axion that runs almost the entire length of their body. So if you, di if you dissect a giant squid, you actually end up with an axion, which is so large that you can take a probe and you can stick a probe inside the axion and measure potential differences across that axion. This is actually how they started, they learned how neurons work. And um, so, wow, this, so you can, I encourage you to, to watch this video. It will show you, uh, it will show you stuff about the giant squid axion. And this is where they did some of the first experiments. Um, I'm not sure how they got a lot of giant squid axions, um, giant squid are not that common and they're kind of hard to get your hands on. Um, but I think it's really cool because you can then think of this as, so this is a practical application of what you are learning. It is a giant capacitor. All right, so then we can talk about capacitor shapes. Uh, your book introduces a number of different capacitor shapes. The big one that we usually use and that you can file in the back of your brain is the archetypal capacitor, is a parallel plate capacitor with two parallel plates positive charge on one side, negative charge on the other. But you can come, and that's this one right here. So this shows you the equations for the capacitance. The capacitance uh, is always equal to the charge divided by the voltage, the charge stored on the capacitor, note that that's on either side, um, divided by the voltage. In the case of a parallel plate capacitor, that is equal to epsilon naught times A over D. Um, so that the closer your parallel plates are to each other, the larger the capacitance. The electric field inside the parallel plates is then equal to the voltage divided by the distance or the, um, or the charge divided by epsilon a, not a. Um, you can manipulate this if you, um, in some of the problems, there are reasons why you might want to manipulate this. And you could write this in terms of the capacitance. Let me do a quick example. So I can write the capacitance. Uh, the charge is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. So I can then rewrite the electric field as uh, the, let's see, I want to eliminate the charge. So this is CV over epsilon naught A. Um, you might have the area of the capacitance. You know the voltage that you have applied. Um, you can do a number of different manipulations of these definitions. You can also look at other shapes. This is the capacitance of a spherical capacitor. So now you have a, uh, a negative, or a positive charge here and a negative charge there. Now, if you actually have this as a practical capacitor, you would need to have some probe connected to the inside in order to get, uh, in order to apply the voltages. And this capac capacitance has this funny shape here. Now, how would you figure out this capacitance? You would have to figure out what the, uh, so you can use the tools that you built up in the previous chapter, um, and you now know, you know what the, um, you can calculate what the electric field is um, from this charge, and then uh, calculate the electric, the change in electric field between here and here. That gives you the voltage. It is going to give you the voltage in terms of the relative radii of the two, uh, of the two spheres, as well as the, um, as the charges. So um, it, I will leave it as an exercise for the student to calculate those capacitances. It's done in your book, too. Um, if you have a problem with these, I'm not going to re-derive them. I would recommend looking them up in the book. 
You can also have, uh, so this is a cylindrical capacitor. I would note that this has the same geometry as, um, for instance, the giant squid neuron, as well as the coaxial cable that runs, um, well, you guys probably don't have cable TV anymore. Um, but when in the old days when we used to have cable TV, well, I didn't because my parents would not buy cable, um, probably best thing for my mental development that they ever did. Uh, in the old days when you used to have cable, you would have a coaxial cable that ran the cable signal to your house. And that coaxial cable uh, actually had a one terminal on the inside, some insulation, and then a negative, the negative terminal, terminal was wrapped around that. A good feature of this type of cable is that they tend to insulate from noise, um, so it tends to be harder for noise to end up in the cable. And then you can approximate this as a cylinder, uh, and you can calculate its capacitance, which is given in the equation here. Just like in the, um, just like in the previous problem, if you wanted to calculate the capacitance, you could use the, the tools that we had in the previous chapter to calculate the electric field in terms of the inner radius and the outer radius. Um, and you can calculate the, uh, the change in electric field, when, the change in potential when you come, go from in to out. Um, that g would give you the, um, the change in potential in terms of the charge and the radii. You can look this result up from the previous chapter. Um, and then you uh, take the charge that you have um, on the two cables, divide by the voltage, and it will give you an expression for the capacitance. Again, I am going to leave this as an exercise for the student. When we have these capacitors, often what we want to do is combine them into circuits so that we can talk about the way that, uh, the way that electricity moves around in the circuit. Um, so we're gonna talk about how you combine, uh, you combine the capacitance, in, serial and parallel capacitance. So here you can see three different representations of capacitors that you might see on circuit diagrams, parallel plates. Uh, this, is, uh, this one is the most common symbol. This one represents an electrolytic ca capacitor, and this is a variable capacitor. Um, so this has a dielectric um, in between the two, um, and this is, this is one that where you can change the capacitance, and you're probably going to use these two types of devices at least in your laboratory. Um, and we often combine, uh, we combine capacitors in different ways. We talk about capacitors which are in serial and in parallel. Um, this circuit here shows capacitors which are in serial. What it means to be in serial is that if you go around the, the circuit from the positive terminal all the way around to the negative terminal, um, you run into one capacitor after the other. That is, you run into them serial. And this is serial spelled like that, not your breakfast food. So capacitors in serial um, look like this. And we want to talk about how we add the capacitors add capacitors, the effective capacitance in serial, in, when they are in serial. And so we're going to combine these capacitors and write them as one effective capacitance. We're going to be doing this a lot when we talk about circuits because um, we often, we want to eventually calculate the voltage and the current through the circuit um, and we need to simplify it so that we can, uh, so that the problem is solvable, so that we don't have too many variables running around there. So, for a capacitor in series, the effective capacitance in series is going to be, well, the, we, the inverse is that. I'm actually going to write it the way the textbook writes it. So, 1 over the effective capacitance in series is equal to 1 over the first ca capacitance plus 1 over the second capacitance plus 1 over the third capacitance, and so on. So that if you, um, if you want the actual effective capacitance, you have to take the inverse. Okay, ooh, that's not, that does not look like what I meant it to look like. 
So this is your effective capacitance. And let me do an example. So let us take the case where you have, uh, let's do two. Uh, so we'll do two capacitors in series. And I am going to make them 50 microfarads. Oh, uh, we had the capacitance is equal to the charge divided by the voltage. Um, the SI units of capacitance are then coulombs. And then the voltage, let's see, volts are newtons per meter. Um, I can rewrite the volts as uh, kilogram meters per second squared and then times meters. And I am left with capacitance having units of, this is confusing because this is a unit and this is capacitance, units of coulombs uh, per kilo, coulomb second squared per kilogram. This is known as the farad. Uh, and a farad is an awful lot of charge. Um, so a lot of the capacitances that you're going to see in the laboratory have units of microfarads, picofarads, nanofarads, uh, even millifarads are not very common. Um, so they're rather small numbers. So let's do the example here where we have two capacitors that are the exact same size, and we're going to figure out what their, uh, what, how they add up in series. So 1 over 50 times 10 to the negative 6 farads plus 1 over 50 times 10 to the negative 6 farads, and the inverse of that. And then um, this gives us 2 over 50, the inverse of that. And this, I'm going to pull out my 10 to the negative 6, which becomes 10 to the positive 6. Um, outside, oh, but now I'm going to take the, sorry, I'm going to take, let me do this a little bit more meticulously so I don't lose you guys. So I have 1 over 10 to the negative 6, which I can pull out in front, but it's still inverse. 1, and then I have a 2 over, and this is going to be farads, and then I have 2 over 50. Now, this is just going to give me microfarads right back. And then this is going to be 1 over 25, and the inverse of that. So, this gives me 25 micro farads. So when we have capacitances, which we add in series, the effective capacitance is less. Um, so how do we understand that? Um, if you have capacitance in series, when you charge the capacitor up, so you're going to charge the capacitor up, and you fill it up with some charge, the exact opposite amount of charge ends up, uh, well, if you have only one capacitor, so let's look here, um, then there's no net charge in the, um, there's no net charge in the circuit, so you're going to have, if you have a positive charge here, you have a negative charge here. Um, and then here, if you have capacitances in series, you still have to have the same amount of charge. Um, if you add charge here, you had to subtract charge here. And then um, what this tells us is that you cannot put as, m if you have just one capacitor, you can't put as much charge on top of, uh, on it it, so our capacitance is equal to the charge divided by the potential. So if I have the same potential, 
and uh, I cannot put as much charge on a circuit with capacitors in series as I could if they if I only had one capacitor. All right. And the next thing that we are going to talk about is capacitors in parallel. What does that what does it mean to have capacitors in parallel? Well, here you can see a capacitor in a set of capacitors in parallel and what you see is that the positive terminal is connected to each terminal, um, is connected to each of the positive sides of the capacitor so that um, you end up with a positive charge, for instance, in this picture, on the upper side of every single capacitor. And we have another equation which describes the way that you add capacitors in series. I find this one particularly easy to understand. So capacitors in parallel, or sorry, when you add capacitors in parallel. When you add capacitors in parallel, the effective capacitance is just the sum of the capacitances of each individual capacitor. And I think that makes sense because here, you're applying the same voltage everywhere, um, and each capacitor is going to charge up because circuit, because current cannot flow in between these two, um, be between the two terminals. And each capacitor responds the way it would if it were connected to the voltage supply alone. Then it is effectively as if, if we think about parallel plate capacitors, it's effectively as if we smooshed these capacitors together and we just had one giant capacitor. Um, so when you have capacitors in, uh, in parallel, their capacitances add um, add together, and when you have capacitors in series, the inverses of their capacitance add together. Okay, so then what we are often doing in problems in this chapter is taking complicated configurations of circuits and calculating the effective, the equivalent circuit. Um, so you're going to successively, um, you're going to successively simplify the circuit. So here you have two capacitances in series, which are in parallel with a third capacitor. So you're going to write these capacitances as one effective capacitance and replace it by uh, this capacitance here. And then you're going to take these two capacitances and write an effective capacitance here. Um, so, we're going to do a few examples like that. Now, you have a choice. Um, I personally, you can just do it arithmetically. I personally like to actually physically draw the circuit because if I draw the circuit, I am less likely to make stupid algebra mistakes. In an intro physics class, your number one enemy is stupid algebra mistakes. Um, and if I am drawing the, so just like is done here, draw the equivalent circuits for each step, I'm less likely to make a dumb mistake. So now we're going to figure out this effective capacitance. These two are in series, so we use our equation to add them in series. And our effective capacitance is 1 over 1 microfarad. Here I'm going to skip the stage where I write. Um, where I write everything as uh, with microfarads, because everything is in microfarads, so I can just pull the unit out, plus 5 microfarads. Here I am looking for a capacitance which is less. I am going to, the first thing I'm going to do is pull my units out in front. I can treat my units as if they are just an algebraic quantity unto themselves. And now I'm going to add this, but I'm going to add this fraction in a way that makes it, I, I, I can look at this and see that this is 1.2, but that's not as useful of a way to write it. I am going to write it as 6 over 5, and it is the inverse of 6, let's see, yes, 6 over 5, and so that tells me that I have 5 sixths of a microfarad um, as the effective capacitance. So this guy here is 
five sixths of a microfarad. Now, when you have capacitances in parallel, you add the equivalent um, capacitance, just arithmetically. So we have eight microfarads plus five sixths of a microfarad. And huh, how do I want to write this? I can write this as 53 sixths of a microfarad. There are a whole ton of, um, ex of problems like this in the back of this chapter. Um, and we're going to do a lot more examples. If you're in my class, you're going to be doing example after example after example. Um, I would very strongly recommend that you take in each step and just draw the circuit. That also tells, makes it easier, especially as we get to really complicated circuits. Simplifying these circuits into effective, um, effective circuits is going to get ugly as well. All right, so here we have a, uh, a different capacitance. So we can just do this one algebraically. So in our first, they did this first one. Um, so we first go from two parallel um, capacitors to the effective capacitance is C1 plus C2. And the effective capacitance here is C1. As usual, I would very strongly advise that you keep everything symbolic until the very end. Now we can do um, the last step. Uh, ah, and I want to point out here, we're writing the voltage source as a long line over a short line. The um, longer line indicates the positive terminal of the battery. If you have a capacitor, the two lines are roughly the same length. So we are going to call this C effective. And this is the circuit that we want to write from this circuit. So here, this you took these two and replaced these circuit elements by this. And that is going, that is our first step. In our second step, we are going to take these two circuit elements and replace them by just one circuit element. So to do that, I'm going to add the inverses of these. So one, oh, because I now have uh, capacitances in series. So 1 over C effective is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus C3. The expression is ugly, but I can write that C effective is equal to the inverse of 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus C3. There are a few ways that I could simplify it. Um, I can write this as C2 plus C3 plus C1, let's see, C, yeah, this over C1 times C2 plus C3. inverse of this and then here that tells me that that is C1 C2 plus C3 over C1 plus C2 plus C3. Did I need to do that? Not necessarily. Um, it doesn't look a lot simpler. Um, there's no hard and fast rule for how long to simplify. Uh, we, sometimes you can make simplifications which make the answer look pretty. Sometimes you are left simply with an ugly answer. Um, my philosophy when I am grading my class is if I did not ask you to simplify it, you don't have to. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Never work harder than you have to.
That said, I do like a nice, neat, pretty answer. And because most of the problems in, that you're going to run into in an introductory physics class have um, been done before and are one of the few problems that we can solve exactly, you can look for a nice, neat answer as a partial confirmation that your answer is right. That is, that many of the mistakes that you will make tend to make your answer look uglier. So if your answer looks nice, it's more likely to be correct. That said, for instance, on exams, I'm often writing them myself, and I don't always have, I don't always come up with neat answers. All right, now we're going to do each of these examples. Um, and let me write this out meticulously. We're going to start with A. So in example A, the first thing that I'm, now you always have to identify which two circuit components you're going to add first. And we only have rules for adding, adding capacitors that are either in parallel or in series. So here, the only thing, I don't have, an, I don't have a rule for adding some arbitrary combination of, of circuit components, so I'm going to start with the thing that I see that I can do. Now, that said, any two components that you can add, you can choose to do it in whatever order you want, as long as you are always adding correct elements. So that is, like a lot of the problems in physics, you're allowed to do it multiple different ways. You can choose among the many different ways that are correct. Now, that also does tend to make it harder to do the problem because there's a lot of different choices. It can make it really hard for you to check your answers with a fellow student because you may have approached it in a totally different way. Um, but if you do it two different ways, you should get the same answer. The first thing that I'm going to do here is combine C2 and C3. So the circuit that I'm going to have after that, I leave C1 alone. And then I'm going to have an effective capacitance here. And my effective capacitance, uh, so capacitances which are in parallel, add arithmetically. So my effective capacitance here is C2 plus C3. So that one was pretty easy. And then I want to combine these two elements in order to get to um, one circuit, one effective capacitance. So now I have two capacitances which are in parallel, so I can add the inverse of them. So I can take 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus C3, and I have the inverse of all of that. And that is going to give me the effective capacitance of the entire circuit. All right, now we're going to do circuit B. So we want to first start by looking for what is a circuit component that we can combine neatly. And the only one that I can see that we can combine neatly is this guy right here. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Um, so now those two components are in series. When I have a capacitance in series, I have to add the inverses. So I'm going to draw a new circuit. It's going to look like this. If I'm doing a really ugly one, I might introduce new variables so that I don't have to write my equations on the diagram. But all of these are relatively simple. OK, I can't do anything with this circuit element, so I'm going to just copy it over. But I can combine these two. And I, when I am combining the, uh, when I'm calculating the effective capacitance of capacitors which are in series, I have to add the, the inverses. So I have 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. So this is my effective capacitance. And now when I am, now I need to combine the circuit one more time. So I'm going to, I'm going to end up with a circuit with one effective capacitor. And now I have these two capacitances, which are in parallel. And when I have capacitances in parallel, the capacitances add arithmetically. So I am left with this answer right here. All right. Now, for this last one, part C, we actually have two different ones that we can combine. So we have a few different choices. Um, just to be 
pedantic because you know that is sort of the point of teaching is to be pedantic. Um, I'm going to do this one at a time, and I do have an arbitrary choice. I ha I have these two capacitors are in uh, are in parallel, and these two capacitances are in parallel. Okay, so my three choices are. I could combine this one, write a new circuit, and then combine that one and write a new circuit, and then combine the, those two effective circuit elements. I could start with this one, uh, write a new circuit, then write, uh, st move to that one, write a new circuit, and then add the two effective capa capacitances. Or I could move really fast and do both of these in one step. Because this is an intro physics class, I'm going to go slowly, and I'm going to start by doing this effective capacitor. All right, so now I am first going to combine these two. These two are in, um, these two circuits are in parallel. So my effective capacitance is going to be C1 plus C2. And then when I move here, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to keep this circuit element the same, and now I need to figure out what the effective circuit element is for this. These two are, again, in parallel, so I can add the capacitances. This is C3 plus C4, um, and that gives me the, um, the effective capacitance for this element. Now I need to combine these two. Now these two, are, these two capacitors are in parallel, so I have to add their inverses. So I'm going to take C1 plus C2, and the inverse of that, plus C3 plus C4, and the inverse of that. Um, and I have to take the inverse of all of that. So it looks ugly, but it gets the job done. All right, so there's a series of different problems analogous to that, where you're taking different um, combinations of capacitors. And what you're going to do is simplify the circuit you're going to be doing this in the next chapter, too, with resistors. Um, and you're going to slowly simplify the circuit until you end up with um, one effective circuit element. At the end of it, it's going to leave you with a circuit that you can actually make calculations about. And it takes a little bit to get used to. I would recommend, especially in the beginning, writing out the, uh, writing out the diagram showing each successive circuit so that when you, um, so that when you get to the, so at, that when you do each step, you have a way of making sure that you really are completely certain about what exactly you're doing. All right, so what we can do with our capacitor after that is add a dielectric material in between the two terminals of the ca capacitor. So what is a dielectric? A dielectric electric is something which can be readily polarized. So here you can see a diagram of an atom which is unpolarized, and the electrons are evenly distributed about the nucleus. A polarized atom or molecule is one where there is a net positive charge on one side and a net negative charge on another. And so this is a schematic that your book uses a lot to demonstrate the uh, a large scale view of a polarized atom. If you have uh, if you have some atom and you put it in the presence of charges, it will itself polarize. Um, and a dielectric is something which readily polarizes. Um, so if you put a dielectric inside of an electric field, for instance, between two parallel plates in a parallel plate capacitor, what is going to happen is that the polarized at um, the, this is a schematic showing a dielectric with polarized molecules. They don't have to be. They can be molecules that are polarized readily. Um, but in the, um, in the presence of an electric field, what's going to happen is that the, um, the polarized molecules line up so that they generally tend to somewhat cancel out the, uh, they, they tend to counteract the net, um, the net charge. So here, if you have a dielectric, so they line up with the charge. Um, so in the presence of the dielectric, the, um, you end up with a different field immediately adjacent to the capacitor plates. And um, the, you end up changing the induced electric field. Now, in reality, the individual molecules are not perfectly aligned with the external field because of fluctuations, but the average alignment is 
in the direction shown. So the overall, um, so if the initial electric field is in this direction, a positive charge wants to move in this direction, the uh, induced electric field is in the opposite direction. Um, and that is going to change the amount of charge that you can actually put on the capacitor because now you have, if you have your, um, here you have a net positive charge on this side. Well, now you've got a bunch of negative charges that cancel out the, the positive charge locally. So you can add a little bit more charge than you would, could otherwise. Um, and so here this shows what's going on inside a capacitor. Here you have no di nothing in between the two terminals of the capacitor. And then you insert a dielectric. When you insert the dielectric, what happens is that the, um, the polarization of the dielectric partially cancels out the um, partially cancels out the charge on the terminals so that you can get more charge onto it. So here, when, and when fully charged, you have a vacuum capacitance, a, a voltage V0 and a charge Q0, um, and they remain on the surface. Then you disconnect the battery so that you no longer get charges um, traveling, uh, traveling around the circuit. Um, you insert a dielectric, and then you measure the, um, the voltage across the capacitor. The voltage has actually decreased across the capacitor when you do this because the, um, the charges in the dielectric line up so that there is less net charge on uh, this side of the plate and on that side of the plate. Um, so you can, uh, so in an, in, uh, in an empty, um, when you have a capacitor with nothing in between it, you get one electric field, you will actually decrease the electric field if you simply insert a capacitor. So now we're going to move on to a couple different examples. And this one asks us to calculate the effective capacitance. So we're going to do the trick that we did earlier. We're going to successively draw new circuits. So here, the first thing that we are going to do is combine these two circuit elements. And we are going to write um, an effective circuit, which looks like, oh, not like that. An effective circuit which looks like this with two capacitors in series. So when we do that, this capacitor doesn't change, so we can simply copy this over. And this capacitor does change. When we have capacitances in um, parallel, they are additive. So the co total capacitance of this element is 12.5. Um, so this capacitance is 12.5 microfarads. Now we want to add those two capacitors so that we end up with one effective capacitance. Capacitors in series add an inverse. So our effective capacitance is 1 over 12.5 plus, is the inverse of 1 over 12.5 plus the inverse of 0.3 and what we get for that is 0.29 microfarads. So notice here that this number is a lot smaller than that number. So one over this number is going to be a very large number. One over this number is a much smaller number. And if we were doing an approximation, this thing turns out to be roughly negligible. All right, so that tells us how to do that, uh, that one. All right, this is a very similar problem. You are calculating the effective capacitance of this particular configuration of capacitor. So we're going to look for two things that we know how to add together to calculate an effective capacitance. The only things I know how to add together are these guys right here. So we're going to redraw our circuit. And now we're going to have this. And this is 2.5 microfarads. This one, I now have to find a convenient place to write it. We'll do it like this. Uh, this is, now these add an inverse. This is going to give us a very similar answer to the last problem. So we add the capacitances in inverse. 
1 over 0.3 plus 1 over 10, the inverse of that in microfarads, gives us, again, it is effectively 0.29 within rounding error, microfarads. And then we have two circuits in parallel. Um, and when we add, we're going to add those circuit elements, those capacitors together, and create an effective circuit which looks like this. So we have 2.5 microfarads plus 0.3 microfarads is 2.8 microfarads. And when you see these different circuit elements, you're just going to do, um, you're going to look first for things that you know how to combine. Combine those two elements. Keep chugging along until you don't see anything else you can simplify. When we get into chapter 10, you're going to see how to handle slightly more complicated elements. But for now, we're dealing with things that are either parallel or in series. All right. This one is a bit gnarlier. So I'm actually going to do two things. I'm going to do a few things at once. So I can, in one step, combine these guys and combine these guys. I have nice, neat rules for how to do that. So I am going to, I'm going to be careful about how I write this. So now I have this circuit element and that's one effective parallel one effective capacitor, and then here I'm going to get it down to two. Okay, I have not done, I'm going to change colors so this is a little easier to read. I am not doing with any, anything with this here, so I'm just going to leave this as eight, an 8 microfarad capacitor. This one is 1.5 microfarads. And then I'm going to look at this guy right here. So that is, let me call this, I'm going to actually change my color coding. I'm going to color code this. So I am going to put the common, oh, that's not that different, but it's slightly different. So that's going to be this guy right here. And now these are, okay, that's actually easy. These are easy to add. Um, I at just add arithmetically this capacitance, 0.75, to that capacitance, 15, and I end up with 15.75 microfarads. This one's a little bit trickier. I am going to color code it a touch differently. So this is going to be this guy right here. And now I have to add the inverse, so 1 over 5 plus 1 over 3.5, and the inverse of that is equal to 2.06, and I should keep my units here, microfarads, 2.06 microfarads. So then here I have 2.06 microfarads. In my next step, and I'm going to go ahead and delete my work here so that I have some room to draw. So in my next step, I can combine these two, and I'm going to end up with an effective circuit that is three parallel capacitors. All right, and I'm not changing this one, so I have 2.06 microfarads. I'm not changing this one. So I have eight microfarads, and I can simply copy those over. I am now going to 
combine these guys. And that I can do as this, these add an inverse. So I have 1 over 1 1.5 plus 1 over 15.75. And I take the inverse of all of that. And that gives me 1.37 microfarads. So now I can write this as 1.37 microfarads. All right, and now I am left with the final step where I calculate the effective capacitance of these three circuits. These, sorry, these three capacitors. And I am going to get a simple circuit that just has one capacitor. And I just have to add these arithmetically. So I get 10, 11, and then 0.43 microfarads. All right, so. When you see something crazy and frightening like this, don't freak out. Break it into pieces. Do each, look at what you can simplify. Start by simplifying what you can. The circuit's gonna get a little bit simpler. simpler. Simplify the next thing and move on. Um, I do find that sometimes, well, I would recommend drawing pictures because otherwise this thing can get rather tricky to keep track of. And if possible, you might want to get yourself a set of colored pencils or colored pens. I at least like arrows, colors, helps keep track of things. Also, part, as I said in the last lecture, part of what you're trying to do is convey, not just to get the right answer, convey that you know how to get the right answer and show your work clearly. All right, and with that, we'll end here, and I'll see you guys next time when we talk about resistors.